Coming up, the greatest band in the history of our planet to never have a top 20 hit. In fact, they only had one hit, but to call them a one hit wonder, that would be blasphemy. Pretty sure they would have been Shakespeare's favorite band, maybe even Galileo's as well. A band so unorthodox, they play time signatures that don't actually exist, but they find a way to play them anyway. You'll see what I mean. With an incredible ability to connect with their fans, they were the Avengers of rock and roll, and today's song might be their greatest composition, You Decide. From their incredible lyricist's own brush with a fan, it's all coming up. Plus, how I got a rap fan to love this legendary rock band, coming up next. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember uh, actually playing board games like Life, Battleship or Trivial Pursuit with your family growing up, you're gonna dig this channel of nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of this music community. Click the bell so that you don't miss out on our latest. Uh, we also wanna invite you to our upcoming event, Professor of Rock Live. It's gonna be a live series, live events uh, with a legend. It's like inside the actor studio meets MTV Unplugged with a lot of surprises. You're gonna love it. You can get tickets at the link below. Make sure to tell me if you're coming in the comments. I'd love to see you talk music. We also have a Patreon you'll want to check out. There you're going to find an additional catalog of exclusive content. You can even become an honorary producer and help us uh, curate this music history. The music industry can be a mean business. I mean, record labels have broken the hearts of many aspiring musicians and starry-eyed singers. Uh, since the first song, uh, I believe it was a French folk tune. It was recorded by Edouard Leon Scott D. Martin Vale back in 1860. The industry has sucked in and spit out band after band from the outset of the rock era that started in 54. Uh, tragically, the carnage has left uh, some extremely talented people along the wayside of that uh, coveted yellow brick road with their souls crushed and their dreams shattered. Why is it that uh, some bands overcome the obstacles and endure, uh, while others are merely ephemeral footnotes? There is an abundance of talent in the world, that's for sure, but the difference between longevity and a transitory career is not talent alone. Staying power can certainly be attributed to relentless hard work and striking an emotional connection with an audience without succumbing to the trappings of fame. It seems that those uh, are common denominators for groups that have built careers lasting more than a decade, especially those that have remained intact with no breakups and thrived for more than 25 years. I mean, you're talking about the Rolling Stones, U2, Metallica, The Cure, Iron Maiden, and Muse, for example. I mean, there have been comings and goings, but you know what I'm talking about, the core unit staying together. One of the bands that uh, exemplified those vital traits was definitely Rush. That exalted trilogy from Toronto that set the standard for artistic integrity and commitment to their career. The three paragons that made up Rush, Alex Lifeson, Neil Peart, and uh, Getty Lee, they were never glamorous or gregarious, and they never, never compromised their art. Uh, as the band's popularity grew from their core lineup formation in 1974, the trio became rock stars that were worshipped by their diehard followers. It was a fan-artist relationship that was often challenging for the band to navigate. Getty admitted that all three members had a difficult time with the invasion of privacy that uh, comes with celebrity spotlight. But Getty remembers Neil being uh, especially annoyed by random autograph seekers and the sudden demands that eroded his uh, cherished solitude. Neil's struggle with celebrity was candidly and uh, eloquently revealed in the Rush song, Limelight. Neil wrote Limelight in the late 70s to express his discomfort with the constant attention that came with Rush's megastardom. 
Don't get me wrong, Neil Peart loved the multitude of Rabid Rush fans, but he was very shy and extremely private. As people have said, he had a hard time with the intrusive nature of being in the limelight. This episode of Professor Rock is sponsored by Zenny Eyewear. Uh, see yourself anew when you design your own look at zenny.com. It's where you'll look good and feel great with eyewear that you know, satisfies your taste and your budget. I mean, you can design three or four pairs of Zenny glasses for the price that you would normally pay for just one. You're gonna love their price point. You're gonna even love their styles even more. Try it today at zenny.com. So Alex Lifeson understood the meaning of the song very well. Neil's words also conveyed his sentiments about stardom. Alex described Limelight as a song about uh, being under microscopic scrutiny and the band's inherent need for privacy. It's tricky to balance those dynamics without coming off as arrogant or disingenuous. Neil was boldly candid about those conflicting emotions in the second verse of Limelight. Living in a fisheye lens, caught in the camera eye, I have no heart to lie. I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. Once again, the sincerity of Peart's lyricism shines in that passage. It's, it's not in the band's DNA to be fake or to pander. Peart cleverly paraphrased William Shakespeare's famous line, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. from his comedy, As You Like It, originally written near the dawn of the 16th century. All the World's a Stage was, of course, also the title of Russia's double live LP released in, I believe, the 76. In the pre-chorus for Limelight, Peart concurred with Shakespeare's poetry with his own uh, elaborated insight. All the world's indeed a stage and we are merely players, performers and portrayers. each another's audience outside the gilded cage. The gilded cage, now, that was a phrase Peart borrowed to describe the way he was forced to live his life off the stage, uh, away from the limelight. Although he lived within the walls of comfort, he had little or no freedom to enjoy the outside world without being uh, pursued by strangers, trying to get something from him. The term Gilded Cage, that was introduced by the songwriting team of Arthur Lamb and Harry Von Tilzer. Uh, the duo composed a sad story about a woman who married a rich man for his money, not because she loved him. Uh, the woman lived in a luxurious mansion, putting on airs of happiness, but privately she was only a bird in a gilded cage. She's just a bird in a gilded cage, hell, hell. she's sold her soul. Of course, Gilded Cage was also the title of a British crime drama that hit the cinema in 1955 and a silent movie in 1915. You'll probably remember that Sting used it a few years later in his top five solo hit, If You Love Somebody Set Them Free, a few years after Rush used it. When Rush went into the studio to record Limelight as a cut on their epic LP moving pictures, they were in top form, physically and mentally. Their legendary organic collaboration was evident throughout the recording sessions for the record. Limelight reflected the, the uncanny uh, kinetic chemistry between Peart and Getty Lee. Those two had uh, amazing telepathy on that track for sure, and many others. Getty, who delivered a brilliant, isolated bass riff on Limelight, one of my favorites, uh, he interpreted Neil's lyrics with authentic passion, and, and Neil followed Getty's distinctive vocal phrasing with his engrossing, always engrossing percussion. That was another distinctive facet of the magic of Rush, the galvanizing rhythm between Lee's vocals and Peart's drumming. Peart was one of the, the few drummers that had those kind of natural instincts and ability to stay true to his lead singer's cadence. 
or the song could easily fall out of tempo, especially with the unorthodox time shifts on a track like Limelight. The musical arrangement of Limelight with its cascading energy just builds. That was composed by Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson. Some have called uh, Limelight Lifeson's signature song, which is likely a topic of spirited debate among Rush fanatics. We can talk about it in the comments. However, Lifeson stated many times that Limelight was his favorite song to play in concert. Uh, Lifeson singled out the elasticity of his solo on that track, uh, saying that it really stood out to him. He was touched by the fluidity of the sound and the style that he created on that solo, believing that the music conveyed the pathos of the song's lyrics, something he found uh, deeply gratifying, as we all do. Lifeson's lonely character solo was performed on what he called a Henter Sports Caster, which was affectionately nicknamed after Russia's producer, Peter Henderson. Uh, the instrument is actually a modified Fender Stratocaster equipped with a Floyd Rose vibrato arm that became a staple in the vaunted Alex Lifeson soundscape. As much as Alex Lifeson relished the opportunity to play Limelight in concert, he claims that uh, he was never able to replicate the tonality that he produced on the studio recording during their live shows. Limelight was released as the lead single from the Moving Pictures album in 1981. The single rose to number 18 in Canada and it went to number 55 on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, it should have went higher for sure. It was in power rotation on album rock radio in the US. It rose to number four on the Billboard Top Rock tracks. The track has been featured in the films Sunny, uh, Used Cars, That's My Boy, I Love You, Fanboys, and I Love You Man. On March 28, 2010, Limelight became one of five Rush songs inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. When Neil Peart was asked why he thought Rush had such incredible staying power, the late virtuoso responded with his <laughs> lovable humility, I think we've just been damned lucky. That's what he quipped. My answer to that question would be that Rush had an extrasensory ability to connect with an audience. They just did. During their nearly 45 years together as a performing unit, Lifeson, Lee, and Peart, they created music that was a true reflection of what was relevant in their lives and in our lives. The lyrics were a cognitive, mind-expanding awakening and the inspired musicianship, a soundtrack that we adopted for our own idiosyncrasies. Every time I hear Limelight, I'm taken back to a funny thing that happened to me uh, when I was in my early 20s, story time here with the Professor. Uh, I was working as a manager in a customer service call center. I was like 23 years old or so. And my boss was this like tall, lanky guy from California. He was probably about six or seven years older than me. And every day he'd want to talk about, you know, pop culture. We had this daily meeting with uh, the three managers, of which I was one. And then under us, were oh, we were all over a team of like 20 supervisors who were each over about 12 to 15 call center reps who were on the phone taking inbound customer service calls. Anyway, so this tall, lanky guy, I'll call him Andy, not his real name. Uh, he was over the entire enterprise. He was married. I think he even had a couple of kids. But he was always trying to impress these cute girls that were supervisors under us. It's a bit of a show off and he tried to look cool by putting others down. Now, everybody else, of course, kissed up to him because he was the boss and he could give promotions since it was a growing company. So he was, ex you know, everybody was expected to kiss the ring, as you say. He'd always pick on me about music. Remember one day in our meeting in front of everybody, all the supervisors, you know, he said, you know, you can tell a lot about somebody by what's in their CD collection. What do you listen to, Adam? And I, I listed off a few bands and artists. I probably said something like the Beatles, the Smiths, Van Halen, the Who, Rush. So 
Now, soon as I said rush, soon as I said it, he started razzing me. He said something like, look out, here comes the nerd herd. Oh, my dork alert radar is going haywire, whoa. Stuff like that. He was actually really embarrassing himself. The females he was trying to impress were, of course, hanging on his every word like that little puppy from those cartoons. You want I should think up some bones for you? Anything you say, Spike, because you and me is pals. That's right, and it's Spike. They knew if they played their cards right that they'd get promoted. I'm telling you, I was living in real life office space. I even had TPS reports and everything. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh. So he said, oh yeah, Andy, well, what do you listen to? Now, this guy was into whatever was cool. You know, when the Packers were in the Super Bowl all the time, back in those times, he was a Packer guy. When the Broncos beat them in the next Super Bowl, he was a Broncos fan. He's one of those bandwagon guys. It's the same thing with music. So it was no surprise <laughs> when he answered or how he answered the question. He says, well, if you're talking about rap, I'm a Tupac guy. If you're talking rock, I'm a Sugar Ray guy. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I like Sugar Ray. They have some catchy tunes, you know, Every Morning, Fly, Someday, other catchy songs. When my life has passed me by. But even Mark McGrath would say that they couldn't touch the genius of Rush on their best day and on Rush's worst day. As soon as he said Sugar Ray, I put my hand in my mouth to stop the overwhelming laughter toward this total schmuck. I immediately went into action. I said, well, let's do a little side-by-side -side comparison. Get your Sugar Ray album out and I'll grab a, a Rush album and we'll play them side-by-side. So we proceeded to do this and I chose to play Limelight. He played Sugar Ray Fly and then I played Limelight. I could tell that this beautiful, moving rock song totally perplexed the majority of the people in the room. They were taken by it for sure, but it was going to take more than one listen to really get it. I mean, I'm not trying to be a, a music snob, but it was over their head. Afterwards, this guy had a vote, and of course, Sugar Ray won. Mostly because uh, those present wanted a promotion or a good showing when uh, yearly reviews came up. Put your arms around me, baby. Yeah, he laughed it up, made a big hurrah about it. You know, Rush sucks, yeah, in your face, you know, something like that. Funny thing is, about a week later, I was getting out of my car, walking into the building for work, and as I was getting out, I dropped my wallet. It went underneath my car, so I was crawling down to try to get it. And as I went to pick it up, I heard the familiar sound of Boss Andy's new Grand Am pulling up. And do you want to venture to guess what song he was blasting in his car? Yeah, Limelight by Rush. Once you hear this perfect band, you can't unhear them. As new fans like Boss Andy discovered Rush for the first time, they too established a, a personal relationship with the music, and the legacy of the band continues to grow and to grow. We'll always miss Neil Peart. And uh, when Rush announced their official retirement from touring in 2018, it was a somber day. But the breadth of the music that they left us will emanate as a Rembrandt of progressive rock. Not because of luck, as Neil so humbly put it, but because of supreme artistic achievement and uncompromising artistic integrity. When the double-edged sword of fame found Rush, they stayed grounded, never allowing themselves to get caught up in, in the hype and lose their perspective on who they really were as people and as musicians. Nor did they derail from their mission to push themselves creatively, to make music that they were immensely proud of. And they taught us as listeners to stretch ourselves artistically, to, to reach beyond our ability to become better versions of ourselves like Boss Andy, who ended up being a pretty cool guy after that. And it seemed like that all changed for him after he listened to Limelight. Coincidence? I think not. You know, that kid from the Goldbergs was right. There's only one band on the planet that matters, Rush. Also, you gotta read Getty Lee's new autobiography, My F and Life. I'll link to it below. 
can get it on Amazon or wherever. It's amazing. Make sure to leave us a comment about the holy trinity of rock and roll, Rush, Neil Peart, Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and this amazing song, uh, Limelight. Uh, what are your stories? What are your memories of this band and this song? Please share in the comments. Uh, make sure to get your tickets for Professor of Rock Live. It would be a dream. Maybe someday we'll get Getty Lee. Oh my gosh, or Alex, it'd be amazing. Uh, let us know too, I'd love to meet you. Make sure to subscribe to our channel, be a part of our spirit of radio, if you will, and take a look at our merchandise and our Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.